Three unrelated stories, presented as a value pack, none of them long enough to warrant their own episode, but interesting enough to be heard. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Wooden Signs, Paper Plates When I was in my single digits in Hopewell Junction, New York, my school would go on frequent class trips to a place called Sharp Reservation, which was and is a preserve and summer camp near the elementary school that I was attending. We'd load into a bus, travel for about 15 to 20 minutes, and we'd go past a few wooden buildings to a little nature center where we'd learn about bugs and animals, and then we'd go for a walk. On that walk, it's a really good example of how different you interpret things when you're young versus looking back when you're older. I remember every one of the guides being interesting, unlike folks I'd ever seen before. I've seen them since. They're the kind of people who go 20 or 30 miles of walking in a weekend for fun, the kind of folks who care about what kind of bike they have and where their bike can go, like the kind of people who can set off on a conversation with you about a certain kind of tree, and it will not end. But at the time, they were just interesting, chatty folks who talked to us as if we were on their level, and I appreciated that. We would go on these nature walks, and they were intended to be stops along a loop until you got back to the main building, where we would eventually either go into the planetarium they had or take a bus home. I remember us taking these walks, and at the time, what most struck me was that there were these little wooden signs on the trees. You see, they had multiple different nature walks that people could go on, and to keep track of where they needed to go, somebody had carved a little round sign that had a tree or a leaf or something else painted on it, and the guide would explain to us that this would lead us to where we were going and to never get away from one if we were lost, that if we stayed next to one of these little signs, they would protect us. Somehow, this penetrated my brain in a really weird way. I loved the mysticism of trees that had signs that pointed you in a direction and would lead you around, that you were safe on this path, you could make your way around. I was also completely unaware of the idea of forging a path and documenting it with these little medallions. Over time, paths change. Either the dirt gives way or they want to get away from a part of the woods that they want to protect and let it regrow a bit. So they'll change it. And one of the ways they do that is they'll spray paint the sign on a tree or leave a weird marking so that others can go in and set them. And one of the effects of that was that some of the medallions were brand new. They shone as if they had come off of a store or somebody's workbench a day or two ago, while others were well-worn. Uh, the sunlight and the water had worn them down into what made them feel like little ancient memorials. This fascinated me because I thought about the layers of people working on this, folks who were doing things years ago, handing over what they were doing to the next set of people and to everyone working in harmony to make it all happen. So I did what any kid who fell in love with such an idea would do. There was a patch of woods near my house, uh, in between two other houses, and the geography was such that it was pretty difficult for the other neighbors to go into this small patch of woods, so it was kind of mine, kind of my family, and in that self-directedness that a kid does when he's young and has all the energy in the world, I got out paper plates from our kitchen and I drew little trees on them. Each one is close to how I saw it on that tree over at Sharp Reservation. So after I had a stack of these, I went out into the woods and I forged my own path 
I would take nails from my father's workshop and his hammer, and I would put these paper plates three or four feet above the ground, which at the time felt like it was really high, so that I could have my own nature trail on our property. Convenient, right there. Obviously, this didn't really work out. It turns out paper plates don't last very long. Within a day, the moisture in the air, just the ambient moisture, had caused all of the paper plates to sag and become unusable. Since I only used one nail per paper plate, I ended up with a bunch of torn, broken paper. My dream was over. But I think the emotions that I felt and the way that I learned what all that meant guided me many times later when I was building my own paths online and off for others to follow, to inspire them that when they set into the woods, into the stacks, into the places that I was helping to build, they too would know that they would be guided and that they would eventually always get home. The Ceremony of Naked Man I can't even tell you the organization this was part of. I can only tell you that they had hazing, so it goes back far enough that hazing rules were not enacted. I was told about it by somebody who had gone through the ritual and had gone through the hazing, so I know it's true. I'm just sorry I can't give you more detail than that. The pledges, the plebes, had to go through a alarming amount of nearly illegal things. The university had indicated that you could not keep pledges up for 24 hours, so they would keep them up for 23 and give them an hour to go rest. They would make them drink enormous amounts of alcohol. There were a whole bunch of things they had people do that just, well, time hasn't made them better. But he did mention one part of this whole week-long hazing that went on that I thought was actually pretty funny. Hazing itself isn't funny, but funny hazing, I hope you'll agree, is pretty funny. There had been a whole variety of trials and tribulations put on these poor pledges, and at various times they would be in the organization's main hall and sitting around, and occasionally one of the older members would come in and say, we need you, and they would have them do something. So my friend was tapped on the shoulder, and off he was led to the basement. He's brought over to a room he's never been in. They open a door. He goes into the door. Inside the door is a single spotlight, and there is a naked man there. The naked man is that very thing, completely, utterly naked, not wearing a mask, not wearing anything, and his hand, his right hand, is closed. They say to my friend, Plebe, do you see naked men? And he says yes. And they say, Will you take what naked man is offering you? And he says, Yes. And they ask again, Will you take what naked man is offering and he says yes naked man opens his hand and in his hand are a handful of skittles naked man gives my friend the skittles they say to my friend thank you plebe and they escorted him out some time later my friend is hanging with the pledges outside of earshot and, and outside of the organization. And they're just talking about what they went through. And at one point, my friend says, yeah. And the weirdest part was the ceremony of naked man. And as everyone looks at him, turning their head slowly, he realizes nobody else went through the ceremony of naked man. He was it. And that is how my friend the next year, became Naked Man. Finally, whipped cream and brotherly love. My brother started working at Friendly's. For people who don't know what that is anymore, Friendly's was a chain that started out in the early 20th century, run by two brothers, and it was bought out and had become a chain. It 
basically gave you ice cream and some diner food. It was eventually bought by Hershey's and ruined. But for a while, just think of it as a local diner with a really nice ice cream bar. My brother got a job there and was working there in the summer. It mostly worked out, but as soon as he could, he got away from it. One day I visited him at Friendly's. We had a lovely meal and we waved to him. He had on the little Friendly's hat and he was working over in the ice cream bar. And it was a good time, good day, and that really should have been it. My friend and I walk out of the Friendly's and there's a car. And the car has parked poorly, really poorly. And by poorly, I mean the car was parked diagonally across the exit of the parking lot. It was something where you'd have to really work your way around to be able to get out of the parking lot. And for some reason, and please bear in mind, I am 15 years old, I was furious absolutely furious. We walked up to it, just trying to figure out what to do. I noticed that there was a open sunroof on the car, and I had an idea. The kind of idea that I like to think in later years doesn't get past the idea stage, but opportunities presented themselves. My idea was, this car needs some decoration for what it's done. So I walked back, well, stormed back, really, into the friendlies, furious beyond measure, as only a teenager can be. And I walked up to my brother, standing behind the bar, and confused why I was back. And I held out my hands, and I said, whipped cream canisters. And in a movement, a moment that I will always love my brother for, Without a question, without a word, without a hesitation, he turned around, grabbed two industrial size whipped cream canisters, and handed them to me. And I stormed out. I'll go into what happened next in a second, but can you just imagine how that feels when your brother comes in, asks for a thing, and you just turn around and give it to him? What kind of love moves through you for your brother that you would just do that, no questions asked? I still admire it. I still love it, even if the outcome wasn't great. The outcome, of course, was that I immediately stormed right out into the parking lot and emptied both canisters into the sunroof of this guy's car. These were industrial size, so they had a lot of whipped cream to go. They were meant to be an entire day's worth of Sundays on each of these canisters, and I completely emptied them into the guy's car. I put the canisters on the ground, and I begin to walk away. My friend and I go to his car, and we hear people yelling behind us. It's the owner of the car and his friend, and to his credit, his friend did a very interesting thing that did catch me out, which was he flipped open his wallet, then closed it, then claimed that he was an undercover police guy and we needed to freeze. And we did. I actually fell for it. Uh, we sat there and he called the police in and the police came in and they got all of our names, all of our contact information, and they didn't feel a need to fingerprint me. They had all of my identifying information and the information on the car, and we all went out. There ended up being a court case. It went to small claims court, and an agreement was put between my father's lawyer, my friend's lawyer, and the other guy's lawyer. It was agreed upon that he would have the car completely cleaned, and we would have to pay the bill. So in other words, no criminal record for me, for my buddy, nobody has to go to jail, nobody has to go to juvie. The idea is, you know, settle this with cash. That really should have been the end of it, and I'm sure you have some opinions about 15-year-old Jason, but there was one more zinger to it. You see, the guy who I had chosen to fill his car with whipped cream, his parents owned a detailing business. So... They gave him the best detailing job they were capable of. And that included 
having the seats removed and replaced completely. This means that the detailing job was about $2,000, a number that my father paid and that my friend's father gave a few bucks for. To me, I was so livid at this. I didn't understand getting out of a good deal, that I was caught red-handed, and that this money, which my father was generously giving to me, was going to solve the problem for me in the future. No record, no evidence, no nothing. Record completely expunged. Until now, I guess. And as for the lessons I learned from that, well, number one, brotherly love is among the strongest bonds in the world. Industrial whipped cream beats regular whipped cream every single time. And maybe, just maybe, the next time you think you're going to do something incredibly stupid, try to count. I don't know, to 20, to 30, to 60, if you can handle it, because otherwise you're going to have a lot of mess that you need to clean up. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Forrest Fuqua, James Bekoyanu, Scott Roseanne, Joshua Stein, Scott McGrady, and Mark Pilgrim along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Are you prepared to take what Naked Man is offering you? <laughs>